to welcome you all today and thank you for joining the workshop. First of all, I would like to share some slides with you just to welcome you and to make you aware of the Eurocall Association. My name is Tony and I'm the Eurocall Secretary and I just wanted to say a few words about the association and um, you can also check back online if you're watching us via recording. Hello and welcome. Um, Eurocall bring together researchers, practitioners and developers who feel passionate about the use of technology for learning and teaching of languages and cultures. Um, some of our key um, times in the year are our annual conference and also our special interest group events. Um, to find out more about these, please visit the Eurocall website. You'll find a wealth of information there and you also feel free to contact me. You will find my email at the bottom of this slide and a special offer for our attendees of the teacher outreach event is um, a reduced rate of your membership at 50 euros. So if you would like to either take out your membership or extend your current membership, you can do so for 50 euros. So thank you everyone. And I will stop sharing and hand over to Teresa. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I think I would just back up that um... Uh, the importance of that Eurocall network because I became a member of Eurocall some years ago and certainly in terms of my professional development I found it the most welcoming friendly supportive community and you know these days when we when we're teaching especially teaching with technology oh <laughs> we we really have to um, rely on more people because things develop and change so quickly uh, that it's actually very difficult to uh, to do it all alone. Um, I'm just going to share a link in the uh, chat to my slides and then I'm going to share my screen and let's just share the slides and tell you a little bit about what I'm going to do today. So the idea is that this is a workshop and together and we're a very small group here, small but beautifully formed, we're going to curate um, a list of uh, tools that can be useful when we're teaching or working um, online. Um, so hopefully we will be able to contribute our own expertise and experience. So just before we get embarked on that process, I want to give you just a little bit of background. So first of all, to myself, and obviously a lot of this Sophie will know already, uh, and Alisa, you'll also know perhaps some of it from working with me before. Um, I spent 15 years in uh, secondary education uh, as a head of French and as a head of modern languages. Uh, and I was an early adopter of CALL, computer assisted language learning. Um, so we're talking about the days when, you know, you were really, really lucky if you had one computer in your room and you could circulate the students around it to play a game, perhaps to encourage them to participate and increase their uh, knowledge of vocabulary or whatever. There was no such thing as data proje projection in those days. It was, everything was sort of hard copy and uh, materially based. Um, things have changed a lot since then. Um, I then moved into a career in uh, further in, in higher education and I started teaching uh, at Warwick University uh, as, again as a language specialist um, more and more using resources the, that the internet put in front of us to make sure that I could keep my French going. Um, because you're very aware, especially when you've got two young children, you're very aware that you start to lose some of those connections that you have and that the language moves on, whether you're there or not. So it became for me a really useful way of keeping my own professional development going. And then by extension, gradually as the sort of tools came along, I was looking for how I could reach my students and indeed business learners who I was working with, as Sophie will remember at the time, um, how we could provide them with additional resources outside the classroom. I think we kind of fool ourselves in uh, as teachers into thinking that all teaching and learning happens in a classroom. It doesn't. 
most of our teaching and learning, I think if we reflect on our own experiences, we learn it when we're in informal settings, when we're relaxed, when we can get hold of resources, when we can interact with people. You know, some of those conversations you have at the water cooler or over a cup of coffee can teach you so much. Um, so the, the challenge started there for me, but the, at the point sort of 15 years ago when, uh, well now 20 years ago, when the internet was kind of taking off in teaching and we had all sorts of challenges there with websites that would exist one minute and disappear the next, um, things have sort of grown at a pace and that pace I, I would contend actually makes it very difficult to stay abreast of everything. You know, there was a time when you could ask one person or, uh, you know, whoever was the most active uh, in computer uh, assisted language learning, where you should go in order to uh, try a tool or, or solve a problem. These days, we're all having to work much more more smartly maybe we have to um, adapt very quickly so actually we need networks we need trusted networks of people to connect with and share with um, and that's one of the reasons why and I'm sure you've participated in Miriam's session on online identity why I started to become an open practitioner um, practicing it through social media and uh, connecting online with people to find networks I could trust. Um, so where are we now post COVID? And COVID has been a huge issue uh, for all of us. And I suppose even those who've been the most resistant and hesitant to engage in um, online learning have found themselves in a position where actually given a choice between becoming ill or teaching online, more and more people have found themselves teaching online um, but again perhaps without the networks to connect so I wanted to share with you this little um, graphic that was created by Sue Beckingham she's very much been one of my Twitter connections who I've, I've, I trust and who is uh, very helpful in terms of helping me understand or was very helpful in helping me understand this transition that we were making and these are just some of the modes of learning that are going on in our institutions. As you know, within higher education, there is no one way of doing things. Everything's very contextualized. Um, different institutions choose different routes to solve the issues and problems we have. So I was at an institution where pretty much everything was based around in-person in -person education people in classrooms, teachers at front of classroom. That was the default point. Um, and over the last uh, 10 years or so at Warwick, we've moved, with, moved towards a blended scenario uh, where language education is, and I think this is pretty much the default with a lot of language teaching institutions, where perhaps a virtual learning environment holds uh, various materials for students to interact with so that they can continue outside the classroom, possibly um, submit assessments or activities uh, in the virtual learning environment as well. So these are two spaces that we're very familiar with, the in-person in and the blended. Um, two names have sort of been banded about more recently, the hybrid and the high flex. Um, and I think many of us now perhaps would, those of us who are using um, online materials would think that a lot of the things that we do are kind of hybrid. Um, I think that, so this is that we facilitate spaces both synchronous as we are now, we're physically in the same online space together, um, although obviously we're in different home environments um, and also asynchronous materials. Um, which may be through the VLE, but could also be delivered through Facebook or there's all sorts of places that uh, people use these days. High flex has become a bit of a, um, a buzzword. Um, I think it's probably the most frustrating and annoying term that I've come across since I've been working in online learning. And that is that, you know, your class has got a choice. They might attend on person or they in, in person or they might attend online. 
very demanding for a teacher to know what's going on both in the online classroom and the physical classroom in front of them to know how to mediate their time um, I, I'm sure that for managers high flex seems a perfect solution but I think for the rest of us it's uh, it, it's just full of problems um, of course, many, many people have been working in distance learning for years. It's been around for a good 30 years and computer assisted language learning has been very much part of that distance scenario. Uh, funnily enough, a lot of distance learning expertise didn't seem to be the first place that uh, a lot of our institutions turned to in order to understand how best to cope with the pandemic. Um, um, where I put my trust more than anything, really, is in self-directed learning and, and the reason for that as we just sort of said and I saw nods at the time is that actually we as individuals whether we're in a student role or a teacher role we learn following our own internal motivations um, so as a teacher probably the most important thing you can do is find interesting activities that people can get engaged in and involved in and that they can become creators of their own learning and manage their own learning um, so lots of different things going on and if I look at a classroom context and, and you know those of you who have experience my classroom context experience now is dated uh, it's a little while since I've been teaching in a classroom uh, of school children um, sometimes we lose a lot of agency as teachers in those contexts because we're told you must teach with this or you must do it this way and um, other people assume that they know how to manage um, teaching. And in fact, I think that should be challenged as teachers. I think we have to push back on that a little bit um, because if we want student engagement and we want that informal learning to wrap around our formal learning, we need to make sure that the students are happy with what they're doing. I'm just going to point out before I move off from this slide that Sue has shared this graphic using a Creative Commons license. A Creative Commons licensing is one of the aspects that I would recommend looking into if you're not looking into it already. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. So here are some, just some of the issues that we have to consider when we're choosing technical tools uh, for our teaching and the first one actually comes straight right down to copyright and management perhaps one of the uh, most uh, and the biggest legal challenges that has happened um, in the uh, in the real world since the digital world became a place um, is that we hadn't really got copyright rules set up for operating within a digital world um, and that's particularly challenging for those of us who are working perhaps across cultures as well because copyright rules were written based on place and implemented based on place so book publications for example happen um, really on the basis of where a book is published but what about when you publish material and resources online who owns those? Who can use them? Where can they be used? How can they be used? And Creative Commons licensing was one of the ways that um, helps us to address those issues. Uh, I won't dig into it right now, but I just want to flag it up that in fact, um, whenever you upload a resource to an online space, um, whether it's your virtual learning environment or perhaps somewhere more social, your own website or a Facebook page or whatever. As soon as you've pushed that piece of content out onto a digital platform, you are asserting your ownership of it, your intellectual property uh, rights over it. And that can be a problem because you may have included within that wonderful PowerPoint some pictures that you just found online that actually aren't your property. Or maybe when you've shared that, you may find that someone else has, has taken it and is using it in a different way that you didn't envisage. Um, so this is where Creative Commons licensing comes in, um, because when you apply a Creative Commons license, you can assert your ownership and make it absolutely clear how you want your resources used. Um, so as I say, more on that 
in a minute. Another issues, uh, issue that we have to think about is to do with privacy, because we know that really, no matter how safe you feel in a space online, uh, your privacy is at risk. Um, and certainly if you're using tools where you're perhaps giving up um, email addresses in order to use them, uh, there is always a risk that the company that's collecting those email addresses can sell them and they can be used for other purposes. And it's those sort of issues that um, general data protection regulations uh, came out of Europe in order to address, to address things like consent, so that if you uh, do hand over some of your data, you know what it's going to be used for and you can withdraw your consent uh, for it to be used for any other purposes. Um, in the UK, thanks to Brexit, we're in a, a very different situation again. So at the moment we are sort of compliant with GDPR, uh, but there is talk of changing some of that. So um, it's not very clear how the UK thinks of privacy. I think that's an area that we all need to be interested in and uh, to be thinking about. And of course, if we're working with people under 18, if we're asking those under 18s to surrender their personal data, we may be putting them at risk. So we have to think about workarounds and uh, ways of dealing with that. And finally on this slide, but probably more importantly than anything, and it often unfortunately does get last billing when people are thinking about tools to use, we have to think about the accessibility of the tools that we use. Um, and, and that can mean anything from uh, whether people who are visually impaired can actually read what you've put because of you know, the choice of fonts or the size and the way it's displayed whether the tools that you've chosen are accessible in terms of um, whether a screen reader can actually help somebody who is visibly, uh, uh, visually impaired to understand what you're doing. Um, so there are lots and lots of issues there that we have to think about. Um, I'm sorry, but there are more, there are more. Obviously we want agency. We want our individuals to have agency. If they're going to be self-reliant in their learning, we want them to be able to have control over their learning. And, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge for us as teachers, to be able to step away from having all the agency and share it with our students. So that's something that you have to think about as you plan and design for learning as well. How much agency do the students have? And it's been interesting in the two sessions I was in earlier, listening to our Japanese colleagues, um, how they reflected on and shared uh, their student feedback of their choice of tools. It's about involving your students in the process of um, deciding how you're going to facilitate their learning. Uh, and, and that really means working with them and alongside them. And in many cases, learning from them. Uh, Jamie was telling us earlier when he was talking about podcasting that actually the podcast tools that he uses um, were used by one of his students and he got the idea from, from them. So there's lots we can learn by making that a two-way street. There are lots of decisions we make as to whether what we do and whether it is synchronous and asynchronous. Um, that we have to consider where, where it's best used. There was a rush to zoomify everything uh, when the pandemic got underway and uh, I'm quite heartened that during that process people started to realise that actually getting everybody sitting in front of their Zoom screens for a whole day was not an ideal use of their time uh, and that in fact uh, uh, providing asynchronous access to materials uh, was useful. Um, there's a big question, and again, this was raised uh, earlier in the sessions with our Japanese colleagues around cost. Um, many of us as teachers actually spend some of the money that we earn in order to pay for uh, the resources that we use, the tools that we use to create content online. Uh, that may not necessarily be covered within our um, institutional memberships or maybe maybe the tools that are provided institutionally aren't the ones that you want to use. Um, the same applies to students. You know, the, there's a cost involved in maintaining uh, 
gadgets and uh, devices to access your online resources. So whether that's your mobile phone or your laptop, um, and these sort of things have to be thought about because we're seeing, particularly in the UK over the pandemic, that gap widen. Um, and we've certainly seen in schools uh, the number of uh, students who've had huge difficulties being able to access resources simply because if you're you know in a family of four or five and everybody is working online your um, broadband is obviously challenged you may have to pay more in order to get access to the data you may have to take it in turns on the devices in order to see things so that all of those things have a huge impact um, and it's yet something to be addressed uh, effectively really. Um, so at the centre of this really is an uh, eth or ethical questions and I think teachers are well placed to, to think about ethics and to um, centre their thought processes on the ethics of what they're using and making sure that we're not actually making life harder or worse for those who are already challenged. So these are sort of big picture items really and what we're looking for and what we look for really in virtual exchange, uh, which many of you have experienced, is a closing of psychological distance no matter where we're geographically located and that is particularly important, you know, if teachers have, ha have experienced issues with engaging students when they're working online. There are many, many reasons why they may face that. But one of them is, you know, it's very difficult to close that psychological distance if you haven't developed a, a clear identity online and uh, helped to support people in their um, device uh, management and their access to, inter to the internet. Uh, what we would like to have ideally is something like you've got on the picture on the left there of uh, comfortable spaces online where people can easily move to work to with people they need to and there, there are as fewer barriers as possible um, in terms of people having access uh, to the things that you're asking them to do and also helping them to to make those agential decisions about how they want to work and where they want to work. So if that is kind of an ideal with an ethical point at the middle of it, then we have to get a bit tool savvy. Now, I would have said until recently in the sort of debate over pedagogy versus um, technology, I would have come down very hard, very, very uh, clearly on the pedagogy side uh, that you put your pedagogy first and then you choose your tool. And I suppose really after three or four in quite intense years of working with virtual exchange, I've had to rethink that, not to take um, that bipartisan view of it's one or the other, but in fact to recognise that what happens is we as teachers have um, objectives that we and places that we want to take our learners to and we have to think about how we want them to get there we don't want them to be just absorbed in the technology we want to find the tools that are suitable for the pedagogy but there is a kind of iterative process that goes on there that you may try a tool and then if you don't find or if you get feedback from the students that tells you well actually you know I spent ages trying to do this and I just don't get it then there are times when we have to renegotiate and look for other tools. Now fortunately for us um, when we think about being tool savvy we can uh, very easily let me just grab this link for you draw on the um, expertise uh, that we have out there because there is a lot of expertise out there and if we if I come back to my just stop my screen sharing Teresa, are you still there?
let's see. If you just bear with us for a minute, Teresa will rejoin. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm back again. Sorry, I got <laughs> kicked out for some reason. <laughs> Don't you just love technology? Let me just check that my screen is still shared, is it? Are you no. seeing my screen? You're not. No. Okay. I'll only share that again. Right. So let's just pick that again. There we go. So this wonderful group of people led, led by an accessibility expert, Alistair, uh, and um, a technology expert uh, and a teaching expert um, has drawn together through a series of lunchtime webinars, teachers across higher education and um, shared their experiences of tool use and uh, their insights into pedagogy and that's pr produced the most wonderful set of resources so i've given you a link into one of them but there's a huge array um, and they've recently been updated as well so there was one set of webinars that ran uh, and a more recent set that ran in uh, 2020 uh, that, that has updated it since fabulous resources using an open source tool called Xerti. Um, that allows you to sort of very quickly jump through the tool and see the different resources um, and even see the uh, conversations that wrap around them. So I would certainly recommend uh, the Getting Tools to Savvy unit, but there are units on pretty much everything you can imagine on the use of technology, not specific to language learning, uh, but generic, but great resources that are really worth um, taking the time to, to look through. Uh, and it will save you a lot of time as well. So I'm always keen on finding ways of saving time as a teacher because there's never enough hours in the day, are there? Right, so we need to get to the workshop aspect of this um, workshop. <laughs> as there are very few of them, and very few of us, we're going to be working quite hard. So here's the first link I want to share with you, and that's to a set of resources, additional resources, you won't have time to look at them now, but you may have time to look at them in more detail later. So let's again pop these into the chat and bear in mind that you can from Zoom download the chat and take all these links away with you. So uh, to do that, you just click on the three dots, I think, and click save chat. So, yeah, you, uh, you're you nodding, Elisa, because you're very familiar with Zoom, I know. So <laughs> you'll very, very quickly be able to find your uh, find the resources that you need. So the plan here, and this is where I'm going to share my screen again, I'm going to share a document with you, but I will first grab the link to that document so that you can open it if you want to on your own machine. So let's grab that. Um, was inspired by another practitioner, an open practitioner, another uh, person who very happily and regularly tweets his ideas and they're particularly focused on ethics and removing barriers to uh, to education uh, called Jesse Stommel. Um, so this document that I'm going to share in the chat now is a Google document that you all have editing rights to. Um, I'm just going to share it on the screen first so that you can uh, look at it with me before we start editing it. OK, so what Jesse did was to draw up this Google document um, that sort of looks at the different types of technologies that we we use. But he did this from a, a higher education context. So if you click on any of these links, it will then jump to a collection of uh, various things that can be used for that purpose. So it's a document organized in, um, in terms of the functionalities of the tools. And uh, it's very easy to just click on the functionality that you're particularly interested in. We we'll just jump here, for example. Now, I do quite a lot of authoring, creating tools. Um, creating um, materials that then I can share through a VLE or share just openly online. Um, so authoring tools tends to be an area that I look at quite a lot. Um, so any of these, it's important to say, despite the fact that I've just said, you know, it's, we, we need to be thinking about all these different things. 
any of these will, will not necessarily meet every single criteria perfectly. So when we're making decisions, we're probably having to compromise on some of those decisions. But it's easier to make those compromises if we've got a good collection in the first place to work from. So the idea here is that you look at that tool parade and you have a scan down and look at the functionalities, the affordances of tools that you're look at those uh, that we've put there. I've already edited this document to, to particularly focus on the ones that are not um, uh, too demanding in terms of uh, cost or uh, too many barriers in terms of uh, barriers to use uh, for whatever purpose, but they're not all necessarily perfect. The idea here is that you just choose, a t choose uh, an area where you've got something. So let me choose, for example, screen casting here. Well, what we're doing now really is, uh, is a screen casting. So Zoom would be a tool that you could include as a, you could use a Zoom room in order to make a recording and do a screencast. So I would just add Zoom into that list and then I'd click to find the URL for Zoom and then look down and make sure that the it is actually Zoom, the software program that I'm going to, which is here, it doesn't necessarily turn up at the top. There it is, Zoom US. And then I'm going to take that back into my tool parade and I'm going to insert that as a hyperlink. There we go and apply it. Now, that would help people who haven't perhaps thought of using Zoom for screencasting. You know, you can just log into an empty Zoom room, record what you're doing, download the recording, trim it up as you wish and use it as a screencast, perhaps we're showing the instructions for your students to do something. Um, if you're interested in video, you've got some great tools here. So you now have the link to this uh, document. I'm just waiting to see you appear in the document itself up here. So I should see some anonymous people turning up in that document. So if you can click that and open it in uh, either in, your, in a, a new tab on your browser, or I know so if you were on your phone, hopefully it will allow you to open a Google Doc. Great, we have an armadillo in the room. What can you achieve without an armadillo? Everybody needs an armadillo. Um, and feel free to edit and to put your mics on and uh, give me a bit of feedback of what you've what you've heard on what you've heard so far and what you're thinking. That's what I'd, I'd love to, uh, to hear from you. I'll stop my sharing now. There are some nice uh, app or web pages on the internet for accessibility uh, yes. for live um, sub subtitles. Yes, yes. And, and that, we do share that. If that category doesn't exist on the Google document, perhaps we could just create an additional category. Yeah, there is a very nice, um, I think, in, um, not, not in the list, there is a very, um, I've used it intensively the last year, called Formative. Right. I don't know if any of you have used it. It's great because uh, you can create um, an activity and you have lots of uh, functions available. It could be short answers, uh, um, multiple question whatever uh, it could be record yourself it could be anything of, of filling the gaps and technically when you share it with your class and you add added your well it, it's good for higher education or i would say sixth form the, the students have to log in so you see who they are and you have you can see live their answers so when working a full year online with, um, um, you know, people who started French as their first year and who were in their second as a minor, it was really helpful to guide them 
uh, because I could see live the answer and I would say, oh, remember two, <laughs> there is always what at the end. I would just give little hints like that. And um, they said they really appreciate it because they, they improved a lot, especially for object pronouns. We worked every week because uh, I worked on memorization and I always rework what we've been working on before. Um, and seeing the answers or um, formative is really nice because you can set um, that if the students have the, has, sorry, the, the right answer, a little green light is showing. So sometimes they just need that or sometimes they just try to yes. get the, the green lights. Oh, it's still red, it's still red. Why is it still red? Or sometimes it's just because punctuation is different. But sometimes I make them think, what do you do when there is a preceding direct object? Oh <laughs> you know? my goodness, yes. And sometimes, oh no, that's <laughs> that. Uh, so we are in meta, you know, meta language. And that's great because they, they understand my hints after a while, after like six weeks of practicing. But it's great because I'm far away, they're far away, but I could still... Uh, had them live on what they were writing. So it's good to see their level. Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to give us the link to it. Or the, yeah, <laughs> I've always waited I'm for excited the app now. To, it's formative.com. <laughs> formative.com. Yeah, it's... I'm going to have a... I was waiting for the app to download, sorry. Oh, no Because I've got too many apps on my team. <laughs> Real-time formative instruction. Here it is. Right, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put it into the doc. And, you know, there is an AI, which is absolutely great for time, um, time, 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 for time. Uh, for example, if, if you see that a student has written the, the right answer but with a, a capital letter, you can accept the answer and it will uh, be added to the set of acceptable answers. So that some of the answers are going to correct by themselves just because you accepted that. And it's really great to, to gain some time. So when what I'm think? seeing from this, it's just browsing the website, is actually it's it's you're saying it's uh, it's not actually an accessibility tool. It's actually a, no. a, a, a quiz tool. A quiz tool, yeah, but it, it includes quite a few things, doesn't it? So it's sort of feedback, uh, interactive, yeah. exercises. interactive, and sometimes when you work with a big group. Uh, and they're working in breakout rooms and you can't talk to them, but you still have your screen showing live answers and you can still send little messages. Remember preceding <laughs> direct yes. object and you've got answers back like, oh my God, I'm such a... Da -da. <laughs> well, I uh, should imagine, but I should imagine particularly those people tearing out their hair doing hybrid um, teaching um, or uh, high flex where perhaps yeah. they've got people in front of them and they've got people online, you, you know, that it's, it, it would help you address some of those. Now, for me, I would always go straight down to the very bottom. Yeah. And now what I want to do is to look on the website and see who they are and what they're doing. And All right. You see, straight away, I, this is clearly going to be a commercial thing. So you get free use. For a period of time. Oh yeah, it's but paying. It's point, paying, Teresa. Yeah, it's a yeah. paying application. And, and do you manage to get your institution to? No, to fund I paid. That? I I paid it for. Yeah. So so and, and th there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to factor that into things. And I think we as teachers have to push back on that because, um, you know, the pricing assumes. So if we look at the pricing details, and it, yeah, it's American, so it's all up there in dollars. Yeah. Um, we've actually got some free some free use for educators yeah, yeah, and we have, see yeah. that quite a lot uh, and that's good so there's that question um and as i say you know we're, we're mediating that sort of tricky territory between you know is this is this useful for me and if it is it may be worth me uh, investing in it and that the other question i'll be asking is I, if i'm using a platform like this i'm going to be inputting my um my ideas, my thoughts about how it can work. Yeah. And that, that has a value. Um, and if formative, and no, I'm not saying it would, but if formative were to collapse and disappear tomorrow, where would all my time have gone in creating and setting up? Would I still be able to, to retrieve the things that I've put in there and use them somewhere else? So that's where it leads me to um, 
investigate a little bit more closely as to whether I can go elsewhere, whether I can, if I decided that something else popped up that was very similar, uh, yeah. could I could I navigate, could I easily uh, extract my information and put it into a different tool and it would still work? Um, so, th you know, those sort of questions, I think we have to ask very better good questions, questions of ourselves um, and of the technology in front of us, because we, we're faced with and we had this as an explosion, really, since the days of CD-ROMs, um, an explosion of commercial opportunities. Most of these tools were created not for education. They were created for um, for offices. Um, and, but they've got an educational use and we kind of espouse that educational use in order to achieve our objectives, which is great. But it does mean that education isn't really the central market. Um, so sometimes that leaves us stranded because if we you know, rely on things that then break or go or don't allow us to uh, export uh, into different tools, we're kind of victims then of those companies. Um, so it looks great to me. It looks like a fun tool. It looks like something I would come across. We often as educators, um, you know, we recommend to each other, don't we? Have you tried this? This will really work. Um, Mentimeter has been named earlier this morning uh, as a really useful tool. And I know a lot of people use it. I have been using it. Um, but of course, now it's, uh, you know, there's a cost to using it. Um, and my institution, before I retired, provided um, Vivox, which is an alternative, and I didn't have to pay for. So, you know, I went in that direction. Um, but now I'm no longer in that institution. Uh, I would have to pay to use it. So there are all sorts of things that, you know, are specific to our context. Um, that we can think about. Um, but that's great. I've, I've added it at the moment on the dock and feel free to move it. I've put it under accessibility, but, I, you know, I think I'd probably put it under, in fact, I'm going to move it. I'm yeah, sorry. Put, no, no problems. I, I think accessibility is important and, and, you know, we need to sort of add that as a, as a category, I think. I'm going to put but, it under authoring, but it's, it's more than authoring really, isn't it? Because it's actually, um, it's, it's also, um, Feedback. Yeah, feedback. But they, they are all very, very, very practical and useful questions that the one you analyzed. The, yeah. The, the site with. Well, and, and that's huge, isn't it? Because anything that saves you time is, is really appreciated. Something that is accessible and, and not expensive um, yeah. and that you can download what you have done into Excel docs is yes. uh, something called testmos.com. Right. Do, do you want to, sh I've given you access to the document. Do you want to put Yeah, them, I see if I'm, I'm available. See, if, uh, see if you're able to, to edit them and put them into the document. Because the, another aspect of this as well is that, um, you know, as, as we share and learn from each other and, and particularly see examples, I think as teachers, we, we find it really useful if somebody shows us a, a working example. Because even if that's not exactly how you would use it, it gives you an idea. Um, and one of the things that we sort of uh, talked about this morning was that when you're when you're um, choosing a technology and using it for the first time, that can be quite a long process. Uh, and you know, if if several of you are doing something, it, you it, you can share information around it, and and it, that just shortens that journey as well. Um, so yes, do feel free to edit directly into the document and add your own things and let's sort of make this uh, a document that actually helps us to capture the resources uh, that we find the most useful. I'm keeping one eye on the time here because I know time is uh, going to be of an issue. So let's just have a quick look down here at the Padlet board. Now Padlet, Padlet is, I'm sure you'll already be familiar with Padlet, but Padlet is another good example of the issues of accessibility. Um, it, it's a great tool to use. It's nice and easy to share multiple resources. And what I've done here is to curate a few different resources that help you hopefully think about 
uh, the various issues involved when you're choosing tools, including managing your intellectual property and uh, thinking about accessibility. Um, this morning, our presenters from Japan made um, demonstrated for us very helpfully, I think, at the end of both of their presentations, that it's important to research into our practice. So it's important to collect feedback on our practice. Um, and they were both aware and, and, and mentioned the Hawthorne effect and the importance of, uh, you know, if we ask our students, how are you finding that? They're very likely to say, yeah, it's great. <laughs> but, um, and uh, as a Eurocall member, I'm gonna call on the Eurocall's past here. Uh, Graham Davis was one of our founder um, members and Many years ago, he, he uh, created a website called ICT4LT. That website, although Graham has sadly passed, um, that website is still live and there are some really useful resources. And what I've linked to there is a downloadable um, resource that helps you evaluate um, websites. Now, obviously it was written at a time before um, the sort of sophistication of websites that we see now existed, um, but it's, it's principled and actually the principles are just as valid now as they were 20, 30 years ago. Um, so despite the fact it refers to things like CD-ROMs, and I don't think any of us is using a CD-ROM anymore, um, you will find a really useful um, set of questions to ask yourself when you're choosing websites. Um, our issue, our problem is no longer a lack of resources. Our issue and our problem as teachers is more um, a plethora of resources. How do we decide which ones are the most useful and obviously as um, Sophie's just demonstrated perfectly we try them we test them do we test them in all browsers do we test them on all setups not necessarily we test them on our setup so that's a question and something we need to be aware of um, Padlet for example if you use a screen reader it isn't very uh, helpful um, when you use Padlet because it's actually very confusing for a screen reader. Anybody who's visually impaired would just be bombarded with lots of audio um, cues that wouldn't help them understand what they've got in front of them. Um, all tools will have those kind of issues but that may not be an issue for you in your classroom in your context. So we're walking that tightrope. We're trying to find networks we trust we're trying to better understand our cohorts, our teaching cohorts. We're trying to make ethical decisions. Um, and, and also we, by joining networks, we can actually raise our voice about the things that are not useful to us, um, the things that make life difficult. So for example, if I recommend an app and that app asks students for their personal data, I may be putting them at risk. So we may be feeding back to those companies like you don't want to use this tool in this way because of this. Um, or we may be using workarounds, which people often do and creating maybe a class account. Um, but we're not terribly visible because we're not, as educators, we're not the main market. Um, so it helps to be part of a network to push back on those things. Um, I've also included in here some reflections on one particular area for um, particularly important for schools, but also for um, higher education. When the pandemic came along, um, assessment was very, because it was sort of Easter time and assessments were very much on the cards and imminent, that it did pr it prove to be one of the main um, issues that people were focusing on and the temptation for managers really was to just buy systems. Now I don't know whether you're aware of this but uh, a particular system called Proctorio was one that was um, bought up in large license numbers by um, educators in order to replicate an exam room. Now 
there are some horrendous stories of, of student experience of using this sort of surveillance technology in order to replicate assessment. So the little reflection I've put up on there is actually one from my personal blog um, that looks at that issue of assessment and how do we make sure that when we use technology, because we have to, um, because of our situation, because of the pandemic, we still keep that student-centred approach that thinks about the humanity of the student in difficult times. Obviously, we've had students where, who perhaps have lost elderly uh, grandparents in a pandemic. We've had students who uh, have even lost their homes. Uh, and these sorts of things become part of their uh, life experience. Uh, and I don't think any of us as teachers really want to make life harder. And with, in that particular case, in the Proctorio, you won't have to look very far, but you'll read some horror stories about Proctorio online and uh, the way that company has acted. Um, so what we're really sort of looking to build here is critical digital literacy. So, yes, we want people to be comfortable in online spaces and we want to use tools appropriately. We also need the critical skills and we need to help our students acquire, if they don't already have them, the critical skills. In some cases, I think our students are a step ahead of us because they know that they are not going into some environments because they've already thought that through. Um, but we do have to think things through, which is this last document I'm going to point you to, which you can download from here. Um, we use it within virtual exchange as a way of thinking about, OK, what do I need? What am I thinking? So you can go through that iterative process of thinking through pedagogy and technology. Um, what compromises am I prepared to make? Uh, and obviously, most vitally, uh, we need to make sure that we uh, I'm just going to stick this link in the chat, make sure that we involve students in those decisions. So I'm going to stop my sharing and come back. Marina, hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We've got other, yes, other examples. So please, Aloisa, do put them straight into the document. You should have edit rights so you can put them straight into the document. Um, lots of great ideas. Thank you, Marina, great for word wall. So all you do is edit that Google document that I've put in the chat and I'll put it again in the chat just in case the link wasn't uh, there when you arrived. So let's just make sure. Oh, I think I can see you in the document. Let me just pop that in the chat again just in case. And I'll just remind everybody that you can, of course, continue to edit and use these links. Um, beyond today because if you're having a very full day today you know it is actually certainly in the UK it's a weekend it's a holiday weekend so you know I don't want you to lose your holiday time as well because rest is important for us all as well um, and it's great to have you with us today uh, I'm just doing a quick check back to make sure Tony that I'm on time let me just yep you're on time it's we're two. On. Great. Wonderful. OK, so we're going to. Oh, I can see I've got 215 on here. I thought that's that's more time than I thought. But let's let's just open the floor for any queries and questions. Um, and then people get a few minutes before they go in to see the Valiant project, which I really recommend. That's an excellent uh, an excellent session there. And uh, keeping their attention, which I think is, you know, where most of us are when you're, you know, there's so much going on. It's been very difficult for people. Um, my just a, a comment here, Risa. Yeah, please. Uh, in, yeah. in Germany, uh, we have a lot of problems uh, because of the data protection. I, yes. I'm even not allowed to use Padlet in my classes. Yes. So even in that, higher education, I had a lot of trouble uh, going through some papers, putting names in there. It was awful. So in Germany, using technology, everyone, everybody wants us to, to teach online and to do some interaction, but we are not allowed to use technology. Besides the LMS, uh, which is recommended by school. 
Yeah, this is this is a common problem, and it it was an issue. I think in in, in the UK as well, various um, HEIs said you can you can not use in my H HMI in my HEI. It was you cannot use Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so that was a problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it, I mean the fact is we take risks when we go online, and I'm a member of an association called the Association for Learning Technology. And um, very usefully, right at the beginning of the pandemic, they started a set of resources to help us. And what they were looking to do really was to um, help managers understand that some decisions were not as straightforward as they kind of thought they were. Um, and what we found very quickly was that people needed help in understanding um, you know, it, it wasn't simply a case, if I need a particular tool, and I think in language teaching it's particularly true, we're a bit niche, and what we need um, often is, uh, I'm just going to share this link with you, what we need often is not the mainstream, it's not the same as everybody else is using, we need things that have audio, um, we need inclusive, comfortable environments, um, audio is very low on the list on pretty much every other discipline, um, what you tend to find is then we need support in actually arguing the case for um, for particular tools. In the case of Padlet, what seemed to happen was that um, learning and teaching, um, uh, what would you call it, a learning and teaching sort of school within a, an institution, they were the people you went to and you said, well, these tools um, are particularly useful. I appreciate they're not put on your current tool set, um, but they are really useful. Help help us do that. And uh, what they did was buy an institutional account, and then all the institution could use Padlet if they wished to do so. Um, so it, it's important not just for us as teachers to involve um, our students in decisions around tool choice, but it's also important at the management level that practitioners are involved in those discussions. And to, far too often, as you've just illustrated perfectly, we're just told you do that or nothing. And I, I kind of, I'm being a bit of a militant myself, I would say, okay, I do nothing. <laughs> but that's easy for me to say, because I've retired. <laughs> um, but it is about then getting together and saying, you know, collectively, these are the things I need to achieve. I've not got the tools to do them. Do you still want me to do them? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that we have to be brave, I think, as a profession, um, because you know what, what you want to achieve. I, you know, I certainly wouldn't be um, advising uh, sharing student data because that should be their decision. Yeah. Um, but something like Padlet, where you get, you know, you make a Padlet board that is open and anybody can post and you share the link with the relevant people. There's, no they're not, you're not exposing yeah. them to any, any yeah. risk there. Um, but unfortunately, those decisions sometimes, as you've just illustrated, are not in our hands. Thank you for that. That's a, that, was a, that was a great contribution. Um, does anybody else have any queries or questions? Oh, Tony, people are going to get a few minutes rest before they start the next session, which I think is always a positive thing. So I've tried to concentrate on the kind of um, uh, top level um, themes, if you like, in those slides. But in that in that Padlet, if you get time and I would not, you know, when you've got a few minutes here or a few minutes there do have a little look i've tried to be selective on the resources that i've put there so they're not they're usually about a five minute read or a five or a, you know a five minute video so although it might look overwhelming because there's lots of resources there most of them are quick uh quick things that you can have a little look at and listen to uh and hopefully they'll be useful the biggest one of all actually is that uh um tool savvy teacher future teacher 3.0 site which is vast um, but very useful 
But thank you all so much for coming. It's been an absolute delight and I'm so pleased to reconnect with people I've um, met and worked alongside before and, uh, and new people too, which is lovely. So thank you very much for coming and I hope you enjoy the rest of Euracool Teach. That's the hashtag. We'll be sharing Euracool Teach and curating those resources openly as well. And the recordings from today will be uh, eventually up on the Euracool YouTube channel too. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Um, to those of you who have already joined some sessions this morning, you will perhaps have seen these slides, but for those of, of you who will be catching up by the recordings, I'm just going to speak to you all a little bit about Euracall. I am the Euracall Secretary, and thank you for joining us today. I am going to share my screen. No, let me see. I was there last week. Oh, don't make me jealous. <laughs> so you'll see two slides about Euracall. First one is just a little general information um, where you'll find our details at the bottom for our social media, our Facebook, our Twitter and LinkedIn accounts, and also our website, which is great if you want to go and take a look at some point when you've got a bit of free time. Our president, Dr. Mariam Hauk, and my name is Secretary. Next, just a little bit about us and where you can find us, and also some information about our events, like our annual conference, which happens each year in August, and also our special interest groups. So if you haven't looked into those, you can go to the site and visit um, that special interest group section, and maybe you'd like to join up and organize some um, events with us, which would be fantastic. Um, another thing to note is that if you've attended this workshop or any of the other workshops today, you're able to avail of a special offer um, to take up a membership at an additional 50 euros or else to extend your current membership for 50 euros. Um, so we're very happy to do that. And if you want to get in touch with me, you'll see my email just at the bottom of the screen. Um, now I'll hand over to Elodie. Thank you, Elodie, for joining us to take this session. Um, over to you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, am I able to share my own screen? Yes, yep. I do. Okay, can you see my slides? Super, thanks very much. Um, I've been asked to come today to speak about a project I've been um, involved in called Moving Your Language Teaching Online. Uh, so this is what I will do. I um, will preface this talk by saying that I had prepared this as a pretty interactive workshop but with only two three participants it's going to be a little bit, a bit tricky so I've uh, changed my presentation a little bit I will tell you a bit more about the project uh, but we'll make sure there's plenty of time for discussions at the end but it's, it's going to be a bit less interactive I think than I would have liked it to be but we'll we'll do what we can uh, but I hope it'll be of uh, it'll be useful anyway so um, we'll start with some introductions. Um, the first session I've called Where Are You With Online Teaching? And, and that will be part of the introductions is to find out a little bit more about you, basically. And um, I will then present the toolkit project I've been involved in. I will leave you a few moments to actually go and explore the toolkit yourself and then um, time for you to come back and uh, share your thoughts about it and then we'll do some discussions about um, online teaching, online language teaching and sh sharing of good practice if there is time. We will we will see where this gets us but this is roughly the structure of uh, the uh, workshop today. So first of all I'm, I'm here on my own today but um, I'll very much be talking about a project that has involved uh, many of my colleagues. Uh, so I'll introduce myself first. I'm Elodie Vialton. I come from the Open University. I'm a senior lecturer in French uh, and I've worked at the OU and, and taught online now for uh, 17 years, I think. So um, I have learned a lot about distance language teaching and online language teaching from my 
colleagues and, and from my own practice. Uh, the other members of the team are Hélène Pulquet, who's another senior lecturer in French, Christina Plinus, who teaches German, uh, Shoshana, who teaches Spanish, Karina, German, and then two of our colleagues, Anna Calvi and Kim Richmond, who are associate lecturers, and they teach a range of languages uh, among themselves. I don't know how much you know about the Open University in the UK, but basically, uh, the people uh, on the slide here who are uh, labelled as lecturers or senior lecturers are the people who um, kind of lead modules and design the teaching and the curriculum. Our associate lecturers are super important colleagues who actually are um, in classroom with students, so they do the teaching delivery and the support of students, which is super important, especially teaching at a distance. And so they brought a different dimension that was really, really uh, important to the design of the toolkit and, and to the project. Um, so maybe now a bit about you, yourselves. So I, I've prepared an interactive board, but I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense uh, to do that, then maybe we'll do it anyway. So I'll stop sharing this screen and I will share another one. And um, there's four of you actually. So um, there we go. I'll share a different screen. Uh, oh, copy. And what I will do if I can find the chat again. Can I find the chat again? No. So hang on. Bear with me. I am sharing a link in the chat. Can you all access that? So if you click on that link, you should be able to access a survey. And I will now share my own screen. And I should be able to show your responses as we go along. So if you can start answering questions. And we'll find out a bit more about us. Can you give me a thumbs up when you've submitted so I can double check that it is working? Yeah, there we go. Do answers. Okay, so we have somebody from the UK and beyond, somebody from Germany. Let me refresh. And somebody from Italy. There we go, everybody's here. Uh, what do you teach? So we've got English, French, and French, and virtual exchange. Uh, you are teaching in higher education, and one is other. So if we have more details, will we find out? University, professional school and primary school. Oh, it's really interesting mix. That's brilliant. You are currently teaching blended for two of you and one is online only. You first started teaching before the COVID pandemic and one at the start of the pandemic. So many, well, two of you have got experience of online teaching from before the kind of educational crisis, if you will, if you wish. Uh, Zoom seems to be the most used platform as well as Canvas, Google Classroom and Moodle. Uh, you did receive, two of you received training on online teaching, but one didn't. And I mean, obviously for, from three people, we can't draw uh, conclusions like that, but I've run uh, similar workshops and I've certainly run this 
uh, poll with large groups of teachers um, with UCML, for example. And it was really striking how many people have had to start teaching online without having any formal training. And they've just had to um, make things up as they went along. And so I, th I think uh, that's been a really difficult thing for many people. Uh, so do your views sound Conf strongly confident, one confident, and then, oh, interestingly, the, the enjoyment kind of is two thirds, but the other way around. Um, but summarizing online teaching, one was fun, stimulating, and brilliant. So pretty positive uh, views in the room. That is, that is really good. Anyway, um, let's now, because there's not many of us, there is a time for you to actually tell us about me, about yourself a little bit more. So I'll share my screen again and I wondered uh, shall we start uh, oh I can't see names anymore who would like to start and introduce themselves first the colleague from Italy maybe hello my name's Marina I'm uh, at the University of Padova which is very close to Venice uh, I've been um, uh, teaching at the University of Padova since 1998 uh, as the internet started, yeah, I think it was about um, our four years into internet, but um, um, <clears throat> I've had quite a lot of experience um, teaching using Moodle, and before that we used first class, um, and so I've kind of grown with different technologies. I used to make my own web pages using uh, web authoring tools. Uh, I moved from the sciences to to um, agriculture, then to the School of Engineering, and now I'm at the School of Education, and I work with teacher trainees who are training to become primary school teachers. So I'm teaching them how to teach English at primary school, <laughs> okay. and I also I also have experience in primary school myself. So right. I'm a mu musician and I also um, I do a lot of creative things as well. Oh, brilliant. Okay. That's me. <laughs> oh, really? so Thanks very much. Uh, who's next? On my screen is Teresa. Do you want to introduce yourself as well? Or does anybody, everybody in the room know you? Well, Marina and I have met and Al Aloysia and I have met too. Um, but largely through, I suppose I'm at slightly different because I've retired now, so I can't sort of categorise myself in, in any sort of meaningful way anymore. <laughs> Just me at home, but still teaching and still working with virtual exchange through a uni collaboration. And of course, you're a call. Um, it, Ch but Ch I, Churchill I found... was retired. Look what happened to him. <laughs> oh, oh dear. You do, you, do, you do your best work now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually get time to do stuff, I suppose. But it's kind of, um, uh, I was interested in your question about training because like Marina, um, I've been using the internet to teach for many years, but actually I've had very little training. I've learned from other people. I've um, uh, you go along, yeah. tried yeah. things that have yeah. failed. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and become part of a community of people and, and that's helped me learn so yeah I'm not sure how how I would have taken to formal training especially along I mean I've done you know the formal Microsoft how to use Microsoft stuff and you know I find myself falling asleep on this really so yeah I'm very much more a sort of let's try it out and let's see what this does and yeah. learn by doing really I think it's probably possibly the best way of learning, uh, especially that's the way that allows you to think about what you're doing, do things differently, try different things. Um, but I think in the crisis that we had uh, at the start of the pandemic, there, there wasn't much time for people to, to think. So I think formal training there would have, would have been very useful for, for many different circumstances. Yes, it's true. But that, that formal training need, needed to would had it happened, would have needed to get practitioners talking to management yeah. um, and our technology support. In, as you know, I know in, in my sort of institution, a very traditional research led um, physical institution mm -hmm. that did bits of online 
um, yeah, it would have had to break down a lot of silos in order to do that effectively. And then Zoom came, Zoom appeared. Yes. Didn't it? Well, we, we weren't allowed to use that anyway, so. No, no at the beginning, no. Uh, anyway, um, last but not least, a last participant, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, we have already met all day long. <laughs> and uh, so my name is Aloisia and I'm from Germany. I live near the border to France and Luxembourg and I teach French at uh, the environmental campus, uh, which belongs to Trier University for Applied Sciences. So my I started already going in the planned modus about 10 years ago when I was that disappointed about my students coming from school. Uh, yeah, uh, they had had about five years, seven years of teaching in French and they weren't able to speak. So I was, I said, no, I can't go on with the teaching using books. And I jumped over the ocean to Christina Bauer-Ramasani who was the founder of the T-cell. And she gave me during a week a real individual coaching about planet learning, how to make online courses, how to design them, what to put in it. And at that time, or from that time on, I participated in a lot of Electronic Village online workshops, which run only, uh, every year in December, no, January and February. And then by chance, I discovered that I had a friend in common with Miriam Haug, and that was my second turn towards uh, virtual or online teaching. I participated in the trainings of uni collaboration and I finished this year my um, facilitating training with Solia and I must say that with using this online models, this virtual exchange, my students appreciate this teaching method and didactic yeah, a lot. And mm -hmm. I'm also very glad that I've discovered and uh, investigated so many times in the last years in this sort of teaching. It's really very, very interesting, but it, it sounds like you're all seasoned uh, online teachers then, which is brilliant, it's very interesting. Um, I was going to ask you, it, two of you said you were uh, teaching in a blended mode rather than online only. Um, what kind of a blend is that? Um, for Is it a, some online, some face-to-face, -face, or is it maybe self-study combined with online? Uh, tutorials or is it a blend of synchronous asynchronous what what did you mean when you said you were teaching in a blended mode um, Marina did you were you one of the people who said yes oh. I did I, uh, because um, I have uh, collaboration with um, a professional a fashion school uh, where they are actually in a laboratory setting where they um, cut patterns and clothes and they work with machinery mm -hmm. so they have to go on site to to um obviously they're they're not a big group but uh and so there i have a, a mix um, um when we would be having some modules online in google classroom um together with face-to-face and autonomous uh, learning. And so I would give them um, work to complete, reading to do, listening and viewing. And so I could say that for me, that's blended. It's, it's a mix, yeah. a little bit of a healthy mix. Yeah. And, yeah, it, yeah. and it worked really well. Um, even um, uh, I have some Vogue um, magazine YouTube videos where they have to watch a video, uh, an interview, and then conduct an interview together, and it'd be, you know, so a blend, a blend of media as well. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's great. And um, Aloisia, yeah, for me it's a bit the same. So I 
integrate a lot of soft of the software method or the flipped learning method in my classroom. And so a lot of video creation, interactive videos. And uh, in one of my class, the students go for a virtual internship to France and they mm -hmm. have to create videos themselves. So it's a sort of game. So oh, nice. that's wow. online and gamification and class or face to face. So it depends on the level the students have. That's it. Yeah. So a very personalized blend then. Yeah. And it sounds like you're blending media, but you're also blending methods. And yeah, very interesting. Okay, we'll move to the next slide, which it was again to continue kind of getting to know each other a bit. Um, some questions to reflect on. So what... Uh, are your thoughts about what's happened in the last 18 months or so of teaching? Um, what's been the impact of the move to online teaching for students, teachers, institutions? And um, particular questions, I think, for us in a subject such as languages, uh, do you think the impact has been different for language teachers and why or why not? Um, any thoughts from you on those questions? I think sort of, and it was kind of strange for me, but my last class was fully online before I retired. And it was a business school class. And obviously everybody was in their home environment. Most of them were in um, uh, Japan and Korea and uh, various African countries. They were literally all over the world. And, and it, it, obviously it was language teaching and it was beginner language teaching. And I got plenty of materials and resources and a VLE. And I was used to teaching in a blended way, but it was still a huge, oh my God, how do we cope with this feeling? You know, after 30 odd years, how do we make this effective? And, and one of the first things I realized as I got to know these students was that the core values that I have as a teacher in terms of the use of use of my voice, the closing the psychological distance, the getting to know people yeah. remained and, and probably was even more important mm -hmm. than any of the stuff that was coming from my institution, which was all about, you know, these people have to do this at this time and with these tools. Yeah. Um, so there were huge challenges, but they were sort of there were challenges that I think as a teacher I was equipped to deal with and that uh, the that the support such as it was um wasn't okay. <laughs> wasn't terribly supportive yeah um it, it was managerial but it but it didn't get the challenges of COVID, the fact that, you know, one of my students in Nigeria, there was a there was huge unrest in Nigeria. How mm -hmm. am I, how am I going to worry whether, you know, he's 10 minutes late actually getting into yeah. an online room when he may or may not have power uh, and his life may be threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, these things matter so much more in a global pandemic. The humanity matters so much more in a global pandemic and I think especially if you're getting people to express themselves in a language that isn't their own mm -hmm. you have to create that ethos that is unjudgmental that is um, personal and uh, that allows your students to learn you have to create those conditions for learning yeah um so hugely challenging and and you know I thought of myself as I was just teaching one class uh, twice a week and you know I thought of how my colleagues are going to feel you know next year and the year after if this is a prolonged you know because it takes a long time to think these things through and we haven't necessarily got the infrastructure in place that allows our teachers to learn from each other and to support each other yeah, um, yeah that's so very a huge challenge it's one of the reasons we created the, the project and the, and the toolkit, as I've explained in a moment. So what you've explained really echoes answers we got from other teachers in previous workshops, interestingly, that they've felt that um, 
there's the, the online mode uh, has created distance with their students and they've had to do actually even more work than usual to create a rapport with students. And but also, as you've just described, that this wasn't just a kind of educational rapport, but it had to become much more personal because the circumstances of the pandemic meant that their students were actually a lot more um, vulnerable for some of them. So it's I think it's been very emotional for teachers and, and students as well, which is something a bit different and, and new for many students. We had um, problems with them. Um... Um, we've got a very good director, her name's Caroline Clark, and she was so uh, spot on, despite everything, making sure that some of us had computers at home, just as simple as hardware, yeah. that we were lacking some things. I have a daughter who was doing online lessons, and I'm in another room, and I need a computer. It's not every family has 10 computers for each, you know, so something. And then, then they put into place some... Um, we had um, a, a group every week with another colleague um, to help us to use Zoom. So uh, we're at the beginning. So we were kind of helping each other through it at the beginning. Last, last March, March and April 2020, mm -hmm. it was a real shock to everybody. During one of those Zoom meetings, we said, oh, we're all in lockdown tomorrow from one day to the next. Yeah. And I remember that moment. I said, this is the beginning. Right, I either take this as a new opportunity, right? Roll up my sleeves, get on with it and learn what I can. Or I decide, no, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of um, overcoming my own limitations. Yeah. yeah. And it's ended up being an absolutely amazing experience. Oh, great. Yeah. But I do remember that, that, that line that dividing and I'm, I mean I'm I'm not like the uni open university which is used to this format mm -hmm. from one day to the next my whole life changed <laughs> yeah yeah no it was a, a massive change for for the majority of people Aloysia what was it for you what was it like uh, it wasn't a change for me as I used to work online but when I discovered and I was a bit disappointed when I saw when I still see my colleagues resting there and doing the same online as they do in class mm -hmm. and they failed yeah. because the, the students feedback is oh it's boring it's we don't want to go to this class again it's awful yeah. but I yesterday I had a, a clip and I said oh that's great in Germany they start to restructure the teacher training using now on your modules and because the teachers now they are not trained to cope with the you know with the online challenges but in some bundesland and some regions they have started and they were job ads in the um, in the newspapers so i said covid has some impact on on the on the teacher training finally uh, that's that's good to know that's positive okay i'll i'll move on then and uh start telling you a bit more about the the toolkit project so in um i mean the background you all know about this the the effect of the pandemic uh in april 2020 so about for for us in europe if you like it was about a month after the start of lockdowns and things like that 80 almost 85 percent of learners in the world uh, in 173 countries no longer had access to their learning institution that is a huge proportion worldwide of learners who all of a sudden uh, had to start learning differently and of course behind that is all the teachers supporting them had to start teaching differently many of them were rushed to distance learning um, with very little preparation, with sometimes no equipment, um, with students or learners who didn't have necessarily the right experience, the right equipment, uh, or the, 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 who were in a difficult 
position personally. And that has had a detrimental effect on the quality of education worldwide. Um, teacher and student satisfaction has been very hard for both teachers and learners. Um, and it's uh, and on attitudes to teaching and learning online, I don't know, I'm sure like me, you were reading all the negative comments around uh, the media, for example, about how bad online teaching was uh, when uh, the more experienced of us know that it can be just as effective and interesting and good as uh, other modes of uh, learning and teaching uh, when it is done well. And it can only be done well if people are given the time to develop their own teaching voice, their teaching style and, and teaching skills online. Um, so more personally, the background for me and my colleagues was that um, we uh, were meeting online after the start of the lockdown. Our university actually uh, sent us home before the official lockdown. So I think it was in February rather than March for us. But anyway, when we met online, we, we suddenly realized that we were all saying we were getting calls and emails from colleagues from all around the world asking us for tips and advice and saying, oh, well, you know how to do this and you've done it for, you know, surely at the OU you must be equipped. So can you help me do this? Do you have any tips for that? Um, and this is when we realized that it wasn't just us, but we were all getting those calls. We thought well, there is a need out there and, and there must be something we can try and do to help all of those colleagues. So a group of us got together and we came up with the idea of doing a toolkit um, to share some of our experience and tips with the community of language teachers around the world. So we made the toolkit available in PDF format online and uh, we launched it in October 2020. It had thousands of downloads um, very rapidly. We also um, teamed up with the UCML, the University Council of Modern Languages in the UK, to organize some workshops. Uh, we made 200 places available and they were booked up within less than 24 hours. So we then organized a the second one. Um, so we had massive participation and, and clearly there was a need for people to come together, even if they didn't necessarily want formal training, they, there was a need for them to meet and discuss their approaches and, and kind of have sounding balls or ask for tips. So, so, so that was uh, quite successful and, and useful, we heard. Um, so we received this UCML Small Grant Award and we also got a Fred Mulder Award for Best Educational Practice in December 2020. So it, it sounds like the toolkit was well received. Um, before I show you the toolkit itself, um, just a bit of background. So it was based on our own experience of teaching at the Open University, but of course it was also based on long-standing research into online and distance language learning and teaching. You've obviously, you know a lot about online teaching, so you will know about these references, but it's not that it hadn't happened before. There, there, there's a body of research. There are, uh, there's much literature available about um, good practice um, about uh, principles that underpin good online learning and good online teaching, uh, in particular for language learning and teaching. Also literature we've mentioned here on blended approaches and the inclusion of online learnings, uh, which have been on the agenda, as you show yourself, in institutions other than the EU for many years uh, as part of blends. So it's not that we created this out of a vacuum or just based on our own experience. The Open University is, is quite different from many institutions. So what we do is ne necessarily, isn't necessarily relevant to all teachers, but we based the toolkit on existing research as well. So we created a website um, and I will share the link with you. In a second, no, oh gosh, sorry. Um, I need to go copy the link. There we go. And as earlier, I will put it in the chat. And that will allow you in a second to go and have a look yourself. I'll share my screen again in the meantime. So hopefully you can see my slide again, but you will have a link to the webs the toolkit website. Um, so we created a freely available 
web page. And um, the toolkit is made of nine help sheets, uh, which you can now see them. You can download them as just one big document, PDF document or separate sheets. Um, we based the topics of each sheets on um, what colleagues had told us they had questions about and what we thought was really, really important. So um, there's creating an online classroom, which is kind of about what tools you can use and different approaches you can use it. And that was in particular aimed at people not taught online at all. And some colleagues had institutional guidelines and already had platforms like Moodle or things. So they already had tools they were familiar with that they could just adapt for online teaching, but others had to create everything from scratch on their own. And so this uh, help sheet was particularly uh, created with them in, uh, in mind. Um, creating an online community, which is, as we've discussed already, uh, as Terry explained earlier, is a really, really important um, step in, in creating group cohesion and a good learning environment uh, online. Um, developing your teaching voice online, which is one of the most popular help sheets we have found. Uh, so how to communicate, communicate with students out of uh, at a distance and, and create a rapport with them. Uh, te teaching language skills online, we'd come back to it, but as I hinted earlier, um, teaching languages involves uh, oral and oral skills, which I think is a specificity of language teaching and which makes online language teaching, well, depending on where you're sitting or how you experience you are, either particularly suitable for languages or particularly tricky to teach languages, but it was definitely worth a, a help sheet. Uh, we created one on facilitating a language tutorial online. So this is more for people, um, some tips on, on synchronous teaching online. A uh, help sheet on motivation, which is, uh, we have heard has been very helpful for colleagues. Using a learning management system for those who had no experience of that at all, but had to develop one. Uh, developing assessment strategies online and reflecting on the blend. That's the kind of conclusion, concluding help sheet. Um, anyway, so this is what the toolkit looks like if you if you like. Nine help sheets that are, that are quite brief, they're two or three pages each, and that set out some principles and some quick tips for colleagues uh, who needed to find their way around online teaching very, very quickly. Um, so what I propose we do now, if you don't mind, you've got the link in the chat. I thought I would give you five or 10 minutes to actually go and have a quick look yourselves. So I suggest you maybe download the, the whole toolkit in one document. So that would be at the top of the page. And I'd be really interested in your thoughts when we come back about how you how useful you the toolkit looks at first sight to you. Of course, you won't have time to read it in detail, but it would be good to see what your first impressions are, what looks like the most useful content, uh, content in your context, what content might be missing that is important in your own teaching context, anything that is irrelevant maybe, uh, and then other questions which are maybe more generic or we could which we could come back to later. Would you consider the toolkit as a tool prof for professional development of, uh, for online teaching? And then if, of course, if you have any questions, I'll answer them. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to mention before we do this is we've created the toolkit initially with uh, higher education teachers in mind. And we were, we are now looking at developing one for secondary school teachers. Initially, we thought perhaps one toolkit could address all of those different contexts, but we um, listened to feedback from people and, and decided actually they are very different. There are very different issues uh, between higher education and, and secondary education. The tools and the students are so different that actually it, it made more sense to focus on higher education to start with and, and to develop a second version. So if you have any thoughts about the content in relation to your own context, we'd be very interested. So um, shall we take five minutes for you to have a look 
and I'll mute my microphone. I'll let you look, uh, have a look, and then we'll come back at quarter past. Is that all right with everyone? Okay. Yep, that's fine. Have a look and let me know then.
Okay. I, oh, here's Tony. I was going to say, let's wait for Tony. But here she is. <laughs> so, um, any thoughts then on just your first impressions on the toolkit so far? Clear language. Sorry? Clear language. It's written okay. clearly. Okay, yeah. You know, it doesn't Im immediately assume that you, you, you know everything and make you feel stupid. Uh, it's just a, a, a few things there. I thought, oh, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> it's just clear. It's just nicely written. Well done. I like it. Thank you. Thank mm. you. That's, that's a really good feedback, actually. Thanks. Any other thoughts? Anybody else? Well, I, I must admit, I, dive, I dived straight for assessment because, oh. you know, when lockdown came, assessment was the discussion of the moment. And yeah. it was just... A nightmare. The stuff that came out when we got people together to talk about assessment was all over the place. Yeah. And I love the fact that I mean, I looked at your um, assessment sheet and just looking at the clarity that would have stopped hours and hours of endless meetings if we'd had that in front of us. <laughs> um, I mean, it's great. The, the the issue probably for us would be that almost every short bullet point would involve discussion between people in lots of different yeah. roles and different silos yeah. who often who don't normally talk to each other um but but what I, i'll quickly share in the chat is um and i mentioned it earlier in a session that marina and aluisia were in um was the nightmare that was surveillance technology for mm. assessment mm and the ridiculous um, lengths that companies or this particular company went to um, to uh, protect their product. Um, and, you know, all this pain, all this sort of human pain on top of a pandemic yeah. was so unnecessary. <laughs> um, yeah. And I just love the fact that here we can, you know, we can think about how we uh, have you know instead of trying to replicate what we're doing and have been doing for years and especially what is bad about it we had an opportunity here to rethink um and i i just hope people actually took those opportunities to rethink and i hope i think this is still going to be an issue for schools certainly in the uk um you know it, it, assessment has been a problem there as well the the yeah. lack of assessment um literacy if you like from students from teachers from you know the, oh this is the way it's always been done and this is the way it must be done yeah it, it, it's so uh, yeah it, it just showed that actually we haven't been having enough discussions about what education is and what yeah. it's for interestingly uh, it's been difficult even at the open university even though we were already doing already doing a lot of online assessment but there were still small bits so modules that still had or still have to have face-to-face uh, -face assessments so in particular in professions where there are professional standards that dictate that um, but yeah but not just there it's, it's been difficult there too so assessment is somehow <laughs> always the really really tricky bit um, so yeah I, I, I don't want to pretend that it's, it's been easy for us even with for, for colleagues with a lot of experience is it is not but i i like you really hope that it's a positive it will have been a positive um opportunity for people to rethink the way they're doing and what why we assess and, and what we assess and how and yeah how how has it been in other institutions regarding assessment um Marilania, Alois, yeah. Well, in, um, in many cases, we've had to just eliminate certain aspects. We've had computer-based uh, assessment for um, assessing just the receptive skills, which would be listening and reading, where yeah. you've got multiple choice. Yeah. They would check the badge, identity, you'd have to have the video on, and some cases with the mobile phone at the back, just to show that 
what see what you can see, what the student sees. Yeah. There could be maybe have another tab with the answers on there. All kinds of measures to to make sure that the uh, that it's authentic, that the student isn't cheating. Because in Italy, they do. Cheating actually is it's a, it's, a, it's a part and parcel of uh, of education. They cheat. So, <laughs> you know, who's the cleverest at cheating? Uh, so, so, so some exams just were just oral exams, you know, face to face. And then, then uh, where we couldn't do anything, which would be continuous assessment. Right. So it was, it was very tricky. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Aloysia, what's been your experience? I applied a continuous assessment and in all my classes. I also included portfolios for the first time. Um, in the summer term, but most of the colleagues rested with their old mode of assessment, doing face-to-face uh, -face, uh, exams in a large room, mm -hmm. respecting the COVID rules. Right. Oh, interesting. Do you mind if I ask uh, if you had any thoughts about the, the toolkit? from your five minutes exploration? <laughs> I think yes, I totally agree with Marina because it's clear language and I I, uh, I read the part about uh, uh, the teaching of the language skills and I have already got some ideas <laughs> oh, brilliant. for the next term. <laughs> oh, you will have to share that with me uh, after, after the workshop. I'd love to know what you found useful. Okay, I what I thought I'll do next, unless you've got, no, so next I'll ask you whether you had any questions before I move on. No? Yeah, so if not, I will <laughs> you. Do, do feel free to interrupt me at any point if you do have questions. Um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about research we started doing following on from the creation of the toolkit. So as I explained earlier on, we have run a few uh, launch events with UCMLs and some other workshops like the one today. And, um, and I've looked at the data that we've been able to collect based uh, from those events. Um, we have been looking at this uh, using the, a, a framework, which is the teaching skills, the online teaching skills pyramid. Uh, that was uh, devised by uh, Regina Hampel and Oshi Stickler in 2005. Uh, for those of you who know the framework, they've actually updated it um, 10 years later and they've now got a shorter pyramid. But for the purpose of this uh, discussion, the older one is more useful and interesting. So I've uh, stuck with that one. So this is the idea that uh, when you develop skills for online language teaching as, as a teacher, you kind of uh, develop a set of skills that kind of build on each other. So at the bottom of the pyramid is the very most basic skills that you need to have, starting from very basic ICT competence. Uh, obviously, if you can't operate a computer or get online, you won't be able to teach online. It goes without saying. So it goes from that to the very top of the pyramid, which would be a uh, super experienced and skilled teacher who has been able to develop their own teaching style and confidence and competence. And then there are runs in between in the pyramid, if you like. So the what we did for our research is we analyzed the chat contributions from the big, the big workshops we did, so with 400 participants, where there were very interesting in-depth discussion orally, but that only involved a few participants, but there was a wealth of uh, um, comments, if you like, in the chat from a very large number of participants. And that was that is what we analyzed. And we uh, basically tried to match the contributions in the chat with the different uh, levels of the skills pyramid. And what we were trying to figure out is where on the pyramid, where the discussions so where, what did that tell us? What did the discussions tell us about what teachers had been preoccupied about when they uh, were going, the, starting online teaching or discussing their experience of online teaching? And what that told us about the skills of, the, of, of that uh, cohort, if you like. 
And what we found is that uh, although when the, the pyramid was created in 2005, basic ICT competence and specific technical competence for software uh, were still things that needed to be taught to teachers. We found actually nobody was discussing that. It was just taken for granted. Obviously, teachers today are already used to using uh, a lot of ICT skills and tools, and they did not need any particular training other than occasionally a new tool like Zoom, for example, which we all had to suddenly start learning. But, but basically, ICT competence can be now taken for granted. There was a lot of discussions, however, about dealing with the constraints and possibilities of the medium. So a lot of discussions about, oh, uh, you know, I've used this part of Zoom or that, you know, this is how I use the chat in MS Teams or so, so a lot of the discussions were about that. And the second biggest chunk were, was about online socialization. And that is what I mentioned earlier on when Teresa was telling us that, um, she had to um, um, putting a lot of effort into supporting students and creating cohesion within the groups, getting to know cohorts, et cetera. And, and that was absolutely reflected in the discussions of teachers um, that, that we analyzed. Um, however, and this is what I'd like us to uh, take a little bit of time discussing, uh, the next level in the pyramid is not just about online socialization, but it's about facilitating communicative competence. And uh, to me, this is a really interesting step up the ladder because this is where you actually start focusing on um, skills and competences that are specific to language teaching. So you don't necessarily need to ensure that your students develop communicative competence online if you are teaching, say, math, for example, or other subjects, but um, although it doesn't mean that it would not be a good thing, it, but for languages, it is absolutely necessary because otherwise there is no way your students can develop speaking skills, for example. Uh, language is about communication. If students can't communicate online, you can't teach languages fully. And, um, and so what struck us in the research that we've done is that actually very few of the discussions were about that. And um, so what teachers were definitely discussing how to create cohesion online, how to socialize with their students online and, uh, and to encourage them to communicate. They were not necessarily doing this in the target language. And there were very few discussions about how to facilitate that as part of language teaching. So the reason I'm showing that is not just to talk about our latest research, but I thought that the in I, I thought what could we um, um, focus on to try and share good practice in, in as part of this workshop. And I thought maybe this is the the thing that we could discuss now. So a key aspect of online language teaching is the ability to facilitate communicative competence in the target language. Uh, and so I was wondering whether you would like to share with us how you went, how you go about doing this, uh, what challenges you encounter and, and, and whether you have tips to overcome those uh, or particular approaches that you have found either uh, particularly successful or particularly tricky. But yes, so over to you. I, I hope that is a interesting angle for everyone is certainly one that is uh, a preoccupation for many teachers so I, I thought it was a one worthy of discussion um, so I don't know if anybody would like to start and volunteer some thoughts about this yeah perhaps I can start as I've already yeah. said that I was 10 years ago very disappo disappointed about my students ability to communicate in French. Mm -hmm. So when I have now beginner classes, I ask them, first of all, to send me audio files in which I correct their pronunciation. And the first assessment is always present yourself in French in an audio file. And then in the second step, I asked them to do videos using, for example, voice thread. And they have to communicate uh, the day, how they pass or spend a Saturday or a Sunday. 
And in the next step, um, often I ask them to do some teamwork, uh, going for a virtual uh, trip to France. So presenting a French city, how to go there, what, buying a train ticket, uh, reserve a, a hotel, a reservation in a hotel and so on. So I focus a lot on spoken language because okay. for me, it's very important to, yeah, to speak. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that sounds like really good tips and activities to, to develop this. There's two things I would say. The use of video is an interesting one. Um, do you find that your students um, happily send you videos and happily record yourself? Yeah, yeah. Because okay. I often ask them, I show them a video which I take with a, a puppet or I ask them to take uh, Pixabay photos. Not some even they dare to, yeah, to show their, their rooms where they live, their bathroom, their kitchen. They have no problem. So they're totally free. But I normally tell them to use creative commons because often I show such videos on conferences. Okay, so that, that is really interesting because it, it means that actually by taking the speaking activities um, to an asynchronous mode where they can go away and create something, it means that even though you're asking for video, it doesn't have to feature themselves. Whereas yeah. Yeah. if you They do are it, totally you know. free. They have the choice and really some, they, they are not that shy. They show it, yeah. Yeah. They show their apartment and... Yeah, very interesting. Marina, you've got your hand up, I think. Um, I have an experience with a project. I, I, I teach B1 and B2 level um, speaking skills. So during this pandemic, I, I, I gave them a task of preparing a Padlet project in groups. Um, and it was on healthy living. So they had, um, you know, videos about uh, sports, about training at home, having a home gym, because you can't go to the gym, um, healthy eating. And I, I gave them a task, right, you have to create this lesson online for elementary classroom. These are elementary school teachers. And together um, with a lesson plan, um, post videos and links uh, to your Padlet and give it a title, background. The trouble I found that uh, some students were very, very shy. They didn't like filming themselves yeah. at all. They were very, very nervous. Those that would, uh, would be quite confident face to face, they didn't like taking videos of themselves. They weren't used to it. Others would script their video. So they would be reading. Yeah a self-introduction, and I could tell. It, I, I closed my eyes and said, this is not natural. They've obviously prepared it beforehand, but okay, I mean, there are some limitations, but a lot of it would be scripted beforehand. Yeah. But then um, others would have like a, a Zoom call um, breakout meeting, and that sometimes would be scripted too. So this one would say this. And the, so after a while, they became to be a little bit robotic. Yeah. Um, of course, others were a little bit more honest and, and they made mistakes, but others were just too perfect. So uh, it, it, I have to design the tasks in a different way next time if, yeah. if we're still online. Okay. Mm. Any thoughts then about how... Uh, how to encourage interactive speaking then between students that is uh, that is more authentic I guess that is not like pre-scripted um, well, it will have to be in the breakout rooms and then then you'll have to go uh, I have to go in from one to the next to make sure that they I give them a task and that they don't have time to script it yeah. but there again you know if you've got a group of 60 it's very difficult for me to assess all of them <laughs> yeah it, it's a very very difficult it's a very gray area yeah I need we need more um research into this and uh the best way mo mo most people do prepare videos anyway when they're on facebook or tiktok or they they, they, they prepare it beforehand they don't do it some it's not never yeah. natural is it yeah. so interestingly oh. at, the, at the OU we don't encourage the use of video it doesn't mean that tutors can't use it but we find that actually 
for, for technical reasons anyway, uh, it uses less broadband if you do your tutorials with sound only. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes the tutor would have a video on, uh, so they have a, a kind of visual presence, if you like, but the students don't have to have theirs on. And sometimes students are just less shy if they don't have to have the video on. And that's something uh, that I've experienced as a parent, I guess. My, my son obviously was, school, was uh, homeschooled. Uh, he's, a, he's a teenager. And I've noticed that they their classrooms, they never, ever turn video We talked on. about that before in the previous yeah. Uh, yeah. session, yeah. That, that has some, some, some limitations too. Yeah. I don't like to talk to a black screen, I'm sorry. No, I think it's really hard for teachers. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know. At a certain point, you have to have some type of interaction, otherwise, it, you know. Yeah. But I've heard uh, feedback from some uh, teachers who've said, actually, students then are more likely to speak up if they're not shown. In, in a way, they feel a bit more anonymous, mm. uh, so they're perhaps a little less self-conscious. But I think it, it depends a lot of, on mm, 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 mm. Aloysia, I think you have your hand up. Did you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to ask what is wrong about uh, uh, a pre-scripted video, because I have to confess when I go for a conference and I have to talk in English, or in French, I often, first of all, I put everything down and then I reflected on it and I never use my script when I'm on a conference. But really, first, I must admit, when I go for a conference, my first talk is always written completely down. The whole text I have in front of me, even if I talk in German, it's like that. It, it gives you a feeling of, yeah, yeah, sure of being, yeah. I think I had, we had this discussion endlessly when we were talking yeah. about assessment and it's kind of, it's that performative aspect, isn't it? And it, and I agree, it would be totally normal. It is totally normal to pre-plan and write things down. But if you're looking for the, to assess generative normal language and interaction and speech you, you don't want somebody reading aloud that's a slightly different skill and it's a different sort of performance yeah it's not but, it's not reading aloud using their own words not but i think it's it's totally normal it's human that you it is human yeah, yeah that no, but these, these are these yeah. are scripting these are but, line for line scripting i'm sorry yeah, and the, even in, in it depends, some, doesn't it? It depends some exams, what you're to get. They're, they're reading it word for word. I, mean, um, don't, I don't accept this. So no, no. Case, but I think if you write things down first yeah, of all, so you, and you then have an outline. Yeah, of course. Of speaking afterwards, for me, it's totally correct. It, it's it's one of those things that is so contextual, you know, depending on your students, depending yeah. what you're assessing, it, it's about the, the writing of the criteria and the designing of the assessment, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But what I'm hearing, Elodie, that I find fascinating as well, is that we all as teachers have been, even uh, as experienced online teachers, the challenges of the pandemic have been to sort of navigate a different route. And I, I was very aware of this when I um did my sort of final class I, my usual teaching mode in a sort of face-to-face -face environment was a three-hour class with international students very you know um interactive getting up moving around the room lots of group work lots of pair work Lovely. lots of that but when you find yourself in an online environment you can't do that that physicality was yeah. was really hard for me to to not to, to sort of get through that there was no physicality so yeah. i had i had to find a different way there because that's part of my teacher identity the moving yeah. about and regrouping so there was you know um breakout rooms there were different tools different paces we'd yeah. go and do a quizlet live and then we'd bounce back into a room and then we'd you know then the students would lead something and then they'd be off in groups and and, and so it did involve a lot of jumping about a lot of yeah. switching tabs and uh, yeah. running around so it uh, and with that obviously came a period for the students to you know they they were used to 
clocking into an online site and just being given stuff and working through stuff and I couldn't do that as a teacher that's that's just not the way I operate so you know I guess we've all had to do that sort of navigating of our own teacher identity into a new place and finding what works for us and I personally you know at the end of my the sessions that I had in the final group and maybe maybe this is my age but you know I got I get to the end of an hour and a half online teaching and they would have liked me to have done that for you know two and a half hours mm -hmm. in one session mm -hmm. and I was exhausted mm -hmm. totally exhausted it's energy draining yeah mm -mm. because you're always you know and i've got several devices on but it's also uh, the screen that does that as well screens, yeah yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it's and and that doesn't seem to have been taken into account at all you know certainly here the political discourse has been oh well everybody's been teaching online they've had it easy now they've got to go back to their classrooms it's, it's yeah. Been yeah. Out, yeah. yeah. And, and it's that it, it has really exhausted teaching uh, yeah. teachers which and, is and great students. when we haven't got enough teachers and students. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm conscious of time. so we're, Yes, we're, we're nearly out of time, I'm afraid. It's a shame because we could have spent the whole discussion on this, I think. Uh, thank you very much for your contributions. I'll skip the next thing. Uh, the last thing I really want to do is send you the link to this survey. So I need to um, stop sharing again. Uh, there you go, it's in the chat. I would really appreciate it if you were able to save that link uh, or use the last minutes that we've got now to have a look at this a, a survey. Basically, we uh, put together some questions which we will use uh, the answers of uh, either for, for, for research, but most importantly, for any future iteration of the toolkit, we're hoping that we'll be able to, to update it at some point. So it would be really helpful to us if you were able to take the time and, and share, uh, tell us about your experience and share some thoughts about the toolkit at the moment. I will just briefly show you that I have two screens of links to useful resources. I won't go through them now, but I'm sure we'll be able to share the slides with you. Um, so uh, if, if you are interested in, in other resources that the universities put together, we will be able, you'll be able to find them there. And uh, my last slide uh, is a big thank you to you for attending and, and taking part. It's been really, really interesting discussions today. There's an email address you can use if you'd like to uh, share any thoughts or questions with the toolkit team. And I've put the link to the toolkit, which you already have in the chat otherwise. But do feel free to contact me directly as well as um, or via this email address if you have any further thoughts or any comments or questions or feedback about the workshop. Thank you very much. It's been lovely spending a bit of time with you today. Thank you, Thank Elodie. You. Thank it's you. Been wonderful to have you. Um, just before everybody goes, I'm going to have one quick shout out. The recording can perhaps finish, uh, Tony. But